Hello everyone and welcome to the Garden Organic Podcast. I'm Sarah Brown and I'll be joined by Chris Collins. Yes, it's September and it's the season of mists and mellow fruitfulness, of buttery sunshine and bounty in the growing plot. I hope you're enjoying the fruits of your organic harvest, whether it's runner beans, tomatoes, apples or endless courgettes. Chris and I will be chatting about how to pick and store your produce, as well as how to save your own seeds. We also talk about green manures. Now is the perfect time to try growing them. Our post bag includes queries on tomato blight and brassica whitefly. We know that pests and diseases are a fundamental part of growing, so we discuss the organic way to managing them. The evenings are drawing in this month, which is why I think you'll enjoy the interview with renowned plantsman Adam Alexander. Adam can spin a traveller's tale to keep your ears entranced. He also gives seed saving tips and he tells the stories behind those special heritage varieties he loves growing. So wherever you're listening, on the run, in the car, or just a quiet moment in the potting shed, I hope you enjoy our celebration of September in the organic garden. Okay, Sarah, well, we are coming into a season of change, aren't we? We're coming out the other side of the summer soon. Do you know, I hate summer going, Chris, but the only compensation for it is the fact that there is so much that I'm picking and eating and enjoying. So there's all the veg and the salads that I've been growing. There's the fruits coming in now. Now, pears, mm. I actually don't let myself buy pears through the year because I have two pear trees. And I just can't wait, and I'm just beginning to eat the first of those buttery yellow pears. Fresh off the tree, you just can't beat it at all, can you? And it isn't just you say, because it is... I've I've not really gone shopping for a month this month. I've literally been eating off that allotment. So there's a money, big money-saving angle to this as well, I think. But that I've been doing vegan curries, vegan soups, this kind of stuff, and you think vegan, oh, it's not tasty. The taste of these... This food is just absolutely incredible. I'm quite interested, Chris, actually, because I know you live in a flat and you garden on an allotment and, and on your balcony. I'm presuming that you don't have a lot of space to store this. No, I don't have a big garage with a massive freezer in that because I just don't have that kind of space. So when you're pulling up your veg, beetroots, for instance, yeah. and, and, and carrots and such like, are you sick to death of beetroot now? Well, I, it can get that way, but I actually got a very good tip. About six, seven years ago, I did a programme for UK Style called Britain's Best Allotment, and so I travelled around the country and met these real old boys who have been at the allotment for years, and one of the th- tips I picked up was a thing called a huggy. I think it's called a huggy. Anyone from Stoke who can correct me on that, please do write to us. <laughs> but what that is, is on that site, they actually get an old water an old water bottle or a big barrel, give it a good old clean, and they put all their carrots, beets, potatoes in sand into that, into that bar, and then they just pick it out over the winter as they need it. So you don't actually need a freezer, you can actually do it in situ on your site. And I assume the sand is keeping it at a, a steady temperature. Yep. Is there any moistness in the sand? There is a bit of dampness in there. It was, yeah, there is a bit of dampness in there, but not enough to cause any rot for it to start rotting. And obviously because it's sand, it free drains as well. And it really works. And I haven't seen it down south in any allotments, but on my travels during that TV programme, uh, Derbyshire, I saw it, Stoke, the Midlands up north. It was quite common, and it's a really good technique. And it's important because most people, we do live in smaller properties now, and a lot of us live in flats. So, it, you know, it's, it's a big freezer in the garage is not everybody's luxury, so you have to think around. Also, I think, you know, give it away if you can't eat it yourself. Yeah, that's very true. That's <laughs> yeah. very true. And I think the other thing to be careful of when you're storing any sort of fruit and veg, always just store the perfect ones. Yeah. Eat the imperfects, cut the bits out, but the, they won't store unless they are perfect. Any bruise, any slight nick on the skin, and I'm thinking of apples particularly right. here, but also tomatoes and such like, they will start rotting even when you're storing them in the most perfect You'll get fungal invasion and stuff, so you, yeah, make sure you're, you're not, they're nice crisp items, basically, is there? We've got a page on the Garden Organic website that talks about how to pick and how to store. Yeah. Because um, I know you're quite keen on this. Well, I, was, I, I call it uh, twist and pull, and uh, the example that comes to mind is obviously the courgette. I've got a lot of squashes and pumpkins on the go at the moment. Um, and so just that action of twisting to your right and then pulling, you get a nice clean break. If you don't do that, and what happens is you'll end up leaving a piece of it on there, slugs will come in, you'll get fungal invasion. It's just a nice and neat way to do it. So I think that kind of, and same with apples off a tree or pears off a tree, twist right, pull, get a nice clean break, and you'll, you'll save yourself some grief for that Yeah, as well. that's a good tip, Chris. The other side, of course, to picking and eating is I'm also beginning to think about what seeds I can save now and letting the fruit or the vegetable or whatever either go to flower or to ripen so that I can harvest the seeds. And tomatoes, tempting though it is to eat them all, and they're coming in droves now, Actually, if you really, really like that tomato that you're growing, why not save the seeds? It's really quite easy. Yeah. 
We've got a video, a YouTube video, just go into Garden Organics YouTube channel. It shows you actually, Chris, yeah. <laughs> watching as we, we scoop the seeds out with a teaspoon, wash them and dry them. It couldn't be... It is, it's funny, so I was in, when we were at Tatton, RHS Tatton this year, I was doing seed sowing demos and the amount of people that couldn't believe how easy it was to, to sow tomato seeds was quite incredible. So it's, it's very doable, there's something quite satisfying about it as well. And also with beans, I've got French beans growing and though I want to eat them all, I'm actually keeping back maybe three or four pods which have now got so big they're slightly tough and perhaps not that nice to eat. But if I keep them on the plant, and then as they get bigger, they'll begin to dry, and the seed inside will begin to expand. That's the bean I'm going to be yeah. either eating over the winter, but also it's beans that I can keep to sow next year. Yeah. So yeah. it's self so but The legumes are very easy to do as well, aren't they? They're, they're incredibly easy to do. And I think most people don't think of doing that, but it's actually quite a simple, straightforward thing to do. Talking of seeds, Chris, of course, the one thing you have to do is keep weeding. <laughs> yeah, well, weeds don't, I mean, my allotment, they don't stop. I mean, I'm in London and we don't get a lot of frost and so I, I mean, I've noticed it slowed down. It's been a big year for weeds. I think they've liked the cooler sort of weather we had earlier on. Um, so I've been, it's always been a battle, but they, they, they're, they're always there. You always need to keep an eye on them. And remember, over winter as well, they tend to be vectors. They can overwinter funguses, that kind of stuff. So always pay attention to your weeding. I've got a problem in as much as my quite large compost bin. I've got three in a row, three compost heaps. The one that I'm filling up now is actually beginning to overflow. So right. I need to, because I've got so much It's a good luxury to have, Sarah. It's a good luxury to have. I know, I <laughs> know. But, you know, um, but I haven't got room now to start another one because I've still got the old compost yep. in the previous bin. So a good tip is actually to bag up that old compost. Builders like bags will do it, you get it, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. If you bag all that up, then you've got an empty bay to start building up a new pile in. Yeah, got that sitting there ready for use in the spring then for the, uh, the next year for the season ready Absolutely. to go. Yeah. Absolutely. Now, Chris, I'm guessing that your balcony is, is full and fruitsome, but there's going to come a time towards the end of the month when you're going to be worried about frosts. Are you bringing stuff in? How do you do that? Well, you see, I'm very seasonal on my balcony. Um, it, it's sort of two big blocks to it. So I have what I call my summer bedding season and my spring bedding season. Um, and so I will, a lot of it will go down onto my compost bin, like the petunias, the colour, that kind of thing. I do have some special subjects. I've got a, a, a pelagonium, the calliope, it's a new pelagonium, which has just flowered and flowered and flowered. It's been unbelievable. That will come inside. That will go on the kitchen shelf by the kitchen and that I'll overwinter that I'll cut it back quite hard and I'll overwinter that um, so that thing my roses I've got quite a lot of roses out there they'll get a good old haircut so I don't want them wind rocking in the pots but on the whole it'll be a big clear out I shall take a bit of soil out of each pot and replace it I'll put a bit of comfrey pellet in there as well at the same time and then all my bulbs will go in. So I'm kind of preparing for the next block, if you like. Do you completely change all the soil inside the pot? You say you just take a little bit off... I will take probably... If I'm feeling really fit and I want to run up down the stairs with it, I'll have to take 25% actually, probably out of the pot and then replace it and then put some feed. But I, I, I treat it like a garden, basically. So it's seasonal to me. So I have a lot of bedding in there, a lot of colour in there which is this year has just been absolutely fantastic. I mean, I was sat on it a few weeks ago and the sun was really the beautiful North uh, London sunset and it was the colour, it's been really, but that will come out actually when the first frost threaten and the winds get cooler, that will come out and I'll be thinking about bulbs and forget-me-nots and wallflower and, and then I'll probably do a bit of winter veg as well. So I'll have my winter greens out there, a bit of Mizuma maybe. So stuff that I can carry on cropping, uh, perpetual spinach. So those crops will go in and the whole thing will change. I'm going to make a big plug for sowing this month. The cooler vegetables, yeah. things like mizuna and perpetual spinach. But also, don't forget green manures. Now, I'm in my beds pulling out, by the end of this month, I'll be pulling out bean plants or, or whatever that I've had my summer harvest from. And the beds are looking empty. Yeah. Now, you can either cover them with a sort of low-nutrient mulch to protect them from the winter frosts and rain, but actually a much better thing to do, because the soil is still relatively warm, sow some green manures, field beans, vetch. Those are two key manures at this time of year. And they're, and they're legumes, so they, they, they fix nitrogen exactly. into the soil. Yeah, that's yeah. the role of them, so that you, they will, as they grow, they will fix the nitrogen to the nodules on the roots in the soil. Then before, and this is important, before they flower and fruit, i.e. early spring next year, cut them down and turn them into the soil. You've therefore created a lovely nitrogen base within your soil. 
without you having to do a thing, without you having to go and buy any extra fertilizer. Yes, so soil health, and you literally just broadcast them on, don't you? So nice thick broadcast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Yeah, so I'll try that. I'm really interested in the field bean because it is a labour and has a, I mean, one of the reasons legumes are so successful is obviously they have this rhizobium, a bacteria. It's a good um, example of symbiosis, a big old word. But that fact that the plants are uh, um, interacting with the soil to keep it healthy, basically, yeah. Mustard is usually what I always use because it's just so quick growing and it covers so quickly. So I think I'll use a combo of those this and year. And you'll probably find the frost will kill the mustard. You may not even have to dig yes, it in yeah, the frost yeah. will kill it. Well, it. I remember last year, we, we obviously don't get a lot of frost on things. It grew, but as long as you get it out before it flowers, otherwise you'll be picking it out all summer. Yeah, <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. But if you're a little bit nervous about growing them, don't be because they, they are brilliant at feeding your soil and there's plenty about them on the Garden Organic website. Um, there's a list of the most popular ones, which ones, some break up your soil for you, yeah. some capture this nitrogen. There, there's different reasons for I think I think green manures are a fundamental part of organic gardening, actually. Yes, obviously I we're, 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 we're all about soil health, that's where we start, and that's a really good contribution to keeping that soil nice and healthy. And you don't want bare soil at any time of the year if you can avoid it, because it's losing its nutrients. So just put in a green manure. Now September is the perfect time. Yeah. And also, you're right, I mean, people think allotment, I see my allotment site gets quite empty in the winter, but there's still so much you can grow. Your kale's out there, you can put onions in, first yeah. earlies. You know, there's a lot, well, like we say, all the quick crops, the winter salads, the winter lettuces, mizunas. You can still grow rocket, spinach. I mean, you can still have a very productive allotment site through the dark months. I think that's okay for you down in London. I think further north, when it gets much, much colder yeah. over the winter, I think it, it's tougher. You're going to be facing possibly some quite heavy frosts by the end yeah. of this month. You may be thinking about tidying up your garden or your growing area for the winter, um, cutting back dead stems and things like that, but just don't be too tidy is my advice. Yeah, I think that, um, I mean, we've always been kind of guilty of uh, gardeners have been a bit over tidy. Or certainly when I started years ago in the parks, everything was clipped and formally and, and, and we were on top of it. But now, you know, a habitat pile, one or two habitat piles, is not such a big effort, is it? All you've got to do is put a lot of sticks down. You know, and a few, few leaves, leave some space for the wildlife because they are your asset. And by habitat pile, you basically you mean somewhere that, that, that small insects, small mammals can yeah. go and hibernate and, and get through the winter because they're going to be your friends next year. Yes, exactly. Okay, Chris, a garden pond. I know you're keen on the garden pond. Oh, yeah. Well, <laughs> I mean, I was thinking... I'm seriously thinking about <laughs> building one this year or yeah. creating one this year. You've got advice on that? I have indeed. I mean, I'm thinking also, I know you put one at the bottom of my allotment because obviously for wildlife, if you get some frogs in this kind of stuff, it'll really help you out. So easy to do and at no expense really. So what you need is if you want to do a small you just go and buy yourself a chunk of butyl lime, really, which is you know like a rubber line you get at any garden centre, it's quite cheap. Get a bag of sand as well, okay, that's done. And then I would dig out your pit and I tend to I, I think it's quite important to put a shelf in. So I'd probably go down twenty five centimeter uh, centimetres, come out twenty centimetres and then go down to fifty, so you've ledged it basically. I would then line it with sand because butyl lines can puncture. So you don't want any stones or flint or anything that might be in there. So you line it with sand and then literally put the butyl liner over, weigh it down with some bricks or stones around the edge and then gradually fill it with water. And it will just, as the water goes in, adjust the bricks and it will fit tight as a glove into that hole you've dug. Another little good tip as well is to put in some rocks and stones, be careful obviously of the liner again, just to give access to frogs or newts so they can move in and out the pond. And then you're ready to plant it next spring, really. I mean, you could do that for 20 quid. It's not, not a big outlay. No, it's a good time. Yeah, it, it? I think so. Yeah, and you let it settle over the winter. I'll probably put some alodia in and an oxygenator in there as well to get that balance. And then it just sits there to be planted next spring. And I think that's a, a, a real asset. Nothing um, draws in wildlife like some water. Okay, I'll let you know when I start digging. Maybe. Yes, I might. I'm tempted as well because they're always they're always good fun, aren't they? And, and like you say, you get the wildlife food. I know people who've got them who've got good frog toads in their gardens and they don't have a lot of problems with slugs and snails. Yes. Yeah, so yes. there you go. And those beautiful damselflies. Yes, yeah. Flies. Well, I was fishing at the weekend and, uh, and there was dragonflies and damsels. They're all over the place and they're just, just nice to have around. They really mm. are, yeah. left his quiet fishing trip to meet our guest this month. Adam Alexander is a plantsman and seed saver. He's been a member of Garden Organic for many years and is a keen supporter of our Heritage Seed Library. I think you'll enjoy these two old friends chatting together in the polytunnel. Well I'm here with Adam. 
and your beautiful property. That is a lovely scene where I can see across the countryside. Thanks very much for inviting me. It's a pleasure to have you here, buddy. We always like a good chat, don't yeah, we? we do. <laughs> yeah, we do. Well, both of us, you and I, could talk for we could. forever. And I, yeah, we do. Especially on plants. Yeah. And I want that to, that's interesting, actually, because I know you have a, you're a media background, aren't you? Yeah. So how did you get for this, you have this incredible passion for plants and seeds and sort of edibles particularly. How did you get from the media to being this amazing seed expert? Well, it, it started when I was um, six years old. So I was growing vegetables, fruit and vegetables, long before I became a film producer. It really started uh, uh, with my mother, who was a very keen gardener, and then at school. And I went to um, a Rudolf Steiner school that had a two-acre biodynamic walled garden, which right. fed the school. And they had an enlightened attitude towards discipline, which was detention would be spent in the vegetable garden. <laughs> and uh, so I became very interested in organic gardening when I was really very young, when I was probably 10, 11, 12 years old. But my real interest professionally was to work in film and television. And I probably was unusual in so far as whenever I was traveling on location, I was much more interested in what was growing <laughs> out there than the, the subject matter. About 30 years ago now, I was actually making a, a series about a Welsh industrialist called John Hughes, who founded the steel industry in the Ukraine. And I was in a little city called Donetsk in the late 80s. It was a miserable, crumbling coal and steel town. And this classic story, because I was there with my crew and we were staying in the party hotel in town, which was in a terrible state of decay. And the staff at the hotel didn't like the fact that there were a bunch of foreigners in there and they all went on strike. <laughs> and I wasn't having any of this. And so I said, right, well, they're not here. We're staying. We're taking over the hotel. And I had a crew of, I don't know, 20 people. They all needed feeding. And in those days, you couldn't buy anything in the shops because there was nothing. But the markets were remarkably busy, but way out of the reach of most of the average Ukrainian citizen. But I went in there and I found a woman who was to become probably the most important person in my life, yeah. who was the little old lady who had her plot and was growing crops from seeds that she had been saving and probably her mother before her. And this little old lady had a red sweet pepper. I bought some along with some other vegetables, took them back to the hotel and we cooked some dishes and this pepper was sensational. And it was sweet, but it was, was also peppery. It had some heat to it, but it was, it was very aromatic and fruity. And I thought, oh, this is nice. I'd been growing peppers at home, but back then they were, you know, what I was getting out of a seed catalogue. And I took some seed back and grew them. And they were as delicious as ever. <laughs> and I've been growing those peppers for the last 30 years. So that, was, that, that was the birth of it all. That it's was where it all started. With yeah. a kerchief in a back garden. With a, with a handkerchief yeah, over yeah, her yeah, head. Yeah. Grey hair yeah. and an attitude. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, Brilliant story. Because uh, so, yeah. I would say that I haven't worked in television myself. The world of TV and film is so different from the world of gardening. The thing about working in the media is that you are working essentially in a metropolitan environment. Yeah with a bunch of people who, unless they're working on food and gardening programmes, know absolutely nothing <laughs> yeah. about... And it's all quite high the, pressure as well, is, is what I'm yeah, saying. Yeah, so, yeah. as opposed to gardening, we do that to relax. Now, yeah. I know this is 30 years later, we're going to skip on 30 years, because yeah. you've now, I would say, quite a big authority on, on this subject matter, and you're what we would call a seed guardian. I mean, you have a particular interest in Welsh varieties. Can you tell me a bit about that? Yeah, so I'm very keen to help people to reconnect with their food culture. And in the UK, we have a particular problem is we've become very detached from what it is that we eat. You know, we think that milk comes out of a carton or we think that peas come out of a frozen packet. We don't realise how strong our connection to what we grow has been. And one of the ways to help people to reconnect is to say this variety of vegetable actually was developed or grown in your own corner of, of, of the world. And in Wales, it's interesting, in the Heritage Seed Library, there are three or four varieties of runner bean that all come from South Wales. Right. And they're all distinct. 
one of them is incredibly famous, the Stenner bean, which was a champion bean grown by Mr. Stenner in Cardiff, which won every prize going nationally for 20 odd years. As well as being incredibly long and winning prizes, it tastes fabulous. That is just one example of a crop that if you come from South Wales and you like growing runner beans, maybe you should be growing that one or Brecon Black or Runder Black or Palmeric or whatever it might be. <laughs> and they, well, these beans of these local varieties obviously would grow better here because they're adapted to this climate and adapted to this exactly yeah, yeah. so one they're all basically land races they're all very genetically very similar but they're distinct enough that like everything that you grow if you are saving your own seed it becomes genetically predisposed to growing in its neck of the woods. And do you, um, so you look at the, the growth of the plant, but do you also associate taste with the robustness? The first thing, the most important thing for me, is what it tastes like. I'm oh. not going to grow anything that I don't want to eat. <laughs> and I think for everybody, I mean, the reason why we grow fruit and vegetables is because they taste great. Um, I'm also, I'm sharing a, a lot of seeds with, with with people every year, probably I fill a thousand packets of seeds a year yeah. and I actually want the people who are growing going to try those vegetables or to to really enjoy eating them. Yeah, so and the so taste is fundamental. Taste is fundamental yeah, yeah. and then everything else follows on from right. that. That's really interesting. I think you've got very refined taste buds, I reckon. <laughs> so let's, let's um, say I've never done seed saving before and, um, and I wanted to start out. Tell me a little bit about if I was starting out how I'd save seed. Well, I think... if. The easiest seeds to save, I think, are peas and French beans. And they're dead easy. You just leave a few peas on the vine, let them dry, put them in an envelope and uh, grow them next year. Tend to be self-pollinating. Um, you grow a row of peas. If there's another variety of pea growing next door, it's not going to cross. The Things like tomatoes are also incredibly easy because, again, they tend not to cross. So when you say cross, it means like, like um, you don't want the pollen crossing with yeah, other varieties. Yeah, that's right. You don't want yeah. them to cross-pollinate yeah. with other varieties because then you end up with something different. It's that, not the same plant, basically. It's not the same plant. No. That doesn't mean to say that what you end up with <laughs> yeah. isn't better yeah. uh, because that's what plant breeders have been doing for a very long time. So in comes your taste test, maybe. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, and a very good example of this is runner beans. So runner beans, which are highly promiscuous, they need bees to pollinate yeah. them. And so if, you, if, you're, if you've got a neighbour growing a different bean near you, it's almost certain there's, you're going to end up with something different. What you actually end up with is um, a, 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 a variety, a local variety. And, um, it'll be a cross or a land race, which means that it's, it's synonymous, very similar to something its parent what it originally came from and actually all one has to do is to name it that's all yeah. that people ever did if yeah. you think about yeah. why do, when you buy a packet of seeds it's got a name i was going last year i was going john's long pod so that's right. obviously come from something called yeah, john's. John's. <laughs> yeah, yeah. and if you think about you know where we get amsterdam forcing you know it's a carrot it's called Amsterdam forcing because it was probably bred. It certainly came from Holland. Uh, forcing means that it was be used to grow, you know, at the beginning or the end of the season under cover or whatever. So just with a carrot, it tells you immediately where. Well, it that information from. straight yeah. away. But in the case of runner beans, where you have, you know, fifty years ago, every gardener was growing a bean, probably saving most of the seeds themselves, and you would have a huge diversity. Of varieties growing and for me it doesn't really matter whether it is that different from any other runner bean what matters is it's my runner bean yeah, yeah. it comes from my community from my yeah. town from my county yeah. and that then gives it an identity it's a cultural identity a com completely yeah, true yeah. and if uh, you know i often say um to people if you went on a holiday to italy and you went to tuscany and you met a tomato grower in Tuscany, and you said, do you know what? I think Sicilian tomatoes are better. You'd never get out of the place. <laughs> <laughs> so people yeah. are very proud of their, of their, of their food roots almost. But they yeah, are, yeah, yeah. And, and I find in my travels that this is, this is the thing that I find most inspiring, yeah. is people are passionate about 
what it is that they're growing. It's part of their, their identity. Yeah, that's really important. And I think you're right in a way that um, associating it with our culture and who we are is very important. We don't, we don't, we don't emphasise that enough when it comes to food, do we, really? Well, it's interesting. We are doing it more and more. Culturally, we are becoming more connected through the fact that people do want to know the provenance of yeah. their food. But they're tending to think of the provenance to do with meat, fish, uh, maybe apples. Not, maybe not vegetables so they're much. Not, and in yeah. fact, vegetables are probably the, the one thing that we eat that as growers we can have the most intimate yeah, cultural relationship sure. with how about you give me a little tour of the garden and we have a look at what's going on i can't wait <laughs> so i'm in adam's polytunnel which is thriving with baby plants a lot going on here tell me a little bit about some of these heritage varieties adam i've got a small tomato called grandpa's delight and it was given to me by a woman who lives uh, up in telford and her grandfather had been growing this tomato for many, many years. And she is no longer able to grow them. And she's told me that, you know, they are a, a real heirloom. And so I said, well, I'm very happy to grow a few and try them. And that's what I will do is I'll test this and check it. So you let it seed, you let it go for fruit to seed, and then you'll bulk up on the seed, basically. You'll increase the amount of well, seed. Well, in this case, I will probably grow six plants on. Yep. And first important thing is, does it taste any good? <laughs> yeah. Rule it, number one, it's going to taste good. Gonna <laughs> taste good. <laughs> if it tastes good, and my gut feeling is that it's distinct, yep. that it really is a different variety, then I will save lots of seed of it. Um, and then I will give some seed to the Heritage Seed Library, who will then put it into accession to test it properly right. themselves. Yep. Um, and then it becomes formal then, is it? Is that... it then, <laughs> then it's sort of, yeah. But it, then, you know, and then it's also about its provenance, yeah, you know, is yeah. where did it come from? What were the circumstances yeah. under which it was grown? So I love this backstory. It's an amazing thing about heritage, isn't it? There's a narrative yeah, to it all. Yeah, it's really yeah, good, isn't it? Yeah. And the other thing that I've got in, in the greenhouse is um, it's not just all seeds. Things like lemongrass. Yeah, lemongrass, because that's quite expensive to buy, isn't it's it? It's very expensive, yeah. and yet it is the easiest thing in the world to grow. Go to a greengrocer and buy some lemongrass, mm. and then you take one stick of lemongrass and you stick it in a glass of water and it will send out roots. And it'll root. It's a bit like yeah. a house plant, like it, a house uh, yeah. plants do. Yeah. Yeah. Once it's got a reasonable number of roots in the water, put it in a pot and let it grow on. And then, actually, in a good summer, it'll grow outside very, very happily. Uh -huh. And if it's a mild winter like it is this year, my guess is that it will grow on right through the winter. Yeah, yeah. So, and, that, so, and if you like Thai food, you're winning, aren't you? With yeah, that? Absolutely. <laughs> I'm, some of the things I grow to restore seed... Um, some of them are quite old. Uh, these chilies here are Ukraine or Sulawesi. I was going to say, you've got the word Ukraine. Ukraine yeah, Ukraine. So that, was, that is from seed from 2012. Right. So that's seven-year-old seed. Peppers are a really big part right, of, of okay. food culture. Not just in Ukraine, but all over the world. Yeah, you know, yeah. You think about Hungary. You know, everywhere you go. Yeah. People grow peppers. Yeah. I mean, I found peppers in the desert, you know, from Morocco, <laughs> you name it. So the other thing is, so here's, here's another, here's a classic. So this is a sweet pepper from Tobago, from 2007 seed. So that <laughs> seed is 12 years old. And it's still coming, and, it, and, and it's still Germany. And it's still Germany. Wow. You can see for yourself. One, this one is Huahini. This is an amazing chilli that I found in French Polynesia in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. <laughs> yeah. And I haven't grown it for years. And I was going through my library and I thought, gosh. Time to grow it. It's 12 years. <laughs> and then what else is there here? Then there's, um, then there's this one. Ah, this chilli is Matania. This is a chilli that I found in Rajasthan back in January, which I was told by the plant um, scientists in Rajasthan was extinct because it had become corrupted by foreign um, chili genes, right. namely from modern hybrids. Right. And I found this amazing lady living on a farm in the middle of nowhere yeah. who was growing this chili and she'd been growing it herself all her life and her mother before her. And the guide I was with was just beside himself because he said, at last I can chase my childhood again. Then I'm growing tomatoes. These are grown for the Heritage Seed Library. She's called Stamford Ugly, which is a... <laughs> uh, a uh, the most is, flattering of names. It's great, isn't it? It's an English, <laughs> it's an English heirloom, um, but it's a tomato that can cross-pollinate because the, the stigma 
on the flower protrudes out of the flower. So it means that if a bee pollinates it, it can transfer the pollen to another tomato flower. Right. So those will be grown in isolation. Yeah. I oh, see. So is this okra here? Is it? Yeah. So right. this is this is daisy okra, a Rajasthani heirloom, local okra, and it is absolutely delicious. And I'm also growing a really amazing aubergine, which is called Vish, uh, Vishu Knife. Yeah. And it's really interesting. The aubergine that come from Rajasthan are very small and they have incredibly prickly stems. Really? You need gloves to pick up. <laughs> really? You do. But I thought I would try a few and I've just got... So I've just, oh, there's all sorts of things. These are... Syri- also, these are cucumbers. Cucumbers yeah. from Syria. Wow. That I found in, um, in Aleppo that were actually an ex-commercial variety right at the start of the war there in 2011 wow. and those I grow to eat but also for seed which go to Syrian refugees so, uh, brilliant. all so over going the back place. to Syrian refugees who've yeah. been through it obviously yeah. in recent times and then there's here that these are courgettes Syrian courgettes yep. I'm doing the same thing with oh the other thing I'm just starting here ginger <laughs> yeah. so you can grow ginger yourself if you take a piece of ginger that's got a shoot on it a little bud Yep. And you just put it in soil, and it'll grow somewhere deep. warm, it'll root, and off it'll go. You need the heat for it, though, I see. You do. Yeah, you yeah. Do. yeah. So, yeah. It's, it's so you've, got, you've, got, you've got a yeah, yeah, one yeah, starting the, to shoot. Yeah, yeah, that one's going, and that one's just starting. Wow. Yeah. My, yeah. My, my, my wife would be very pleased. She loves ginger. I know that. She's very into it. She's putting her ginger in her cooking yeah. all the time. But yeah. you could grow that on your balcony. Yeah, probably could. I'll have a go, I think. Yeah. I'll have a go. They take a long time. So you just need to be to patient. Sh- to, you need to be patient. Yeah. They take a long time to set root. And ideally, the time to start them is in January. Right, OK. But growing a lot of courgettes. Yeah. Some of them I grow in isolation for seed. Yeah. And, um, and uh, then there are various people who've asked me for them. So they get. I think them. courgettes, people like them because they, they do what they say on the tin a little bit, don't they? So would you say it's quite an easy plant to grow? It's an easy plant. And these ones from Syria have a very high high fibre content. Right. And actually, once you've eaten one of these, you won't want to eat it. <laughs> you won't go back. You no. won't go back. <laughs> yeah. No, no. That's, yeah, so no, there's quite a lot. Yeah, that's there. just amazing. There's so much going on in here. There really is. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, enough to keep you busy, I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, just to finish off, I'm just curious. I know you've been a trustee at Garden Organic for uh, some time. And I know the Heritage Seed Library is a big, big passion of yours. Can yeah. you just tell me a little bit about your role with those... As, as a trustee and with the HSL? I have a responsibility as a trustee to ensure that the, the charity is being soundly run. I'm also responsible for the financial probity, so it needs to remain solvent and that we are complying to all the rules and regulations um, of, of, of charities. And so we often have some really big decisions to make yeah. as a board of trustees about are we fulfilling our purpose as a charity, can we afford to do it, and how do we move on? Quite a lot of responsibility involved in that. There is, a, there is quite a lot of responsibility. For me, it's hugely enjoyable for a number of reasons. First of all, because actually I think we're a pretty grown-up board. I really like and get on with my fellow trustees, and we have a very open and honest relationship with each other. I think we listen to each other. Oh, very important. And... We're not scared to argue about things. So there can be some very lively conversations at board meetings. Um, But we do tend, I think, to come up with a consensus. I sometimes wish, if only Westminster could operate (laughs) like us. Now now you're wishful thinking (laughs) now. (laughs) With regards to the Heritage Seed Library, because, I mean, I've been a seed guardian for a number of years. I think I must have joined Garden Organic 35 years ago. And I've been a member of the Heritage Seed Library probably for 20-odd years. And I've been very active with the as a seed guardian because as I have found varieties of vegetables in, uh, you know, in my travels yeah. and also been given seeds by like-minded people, I've also felt actually the work of the Heritage Seed Library is incredibly important and to be able to actually help by growing out vegetables for them and being organised about yeah. it and systematic is it's a great thing to do. Yeah. I get a, I get a lot of enjoyment out of it. Well, your enthusiasm certainly affects me as a fellow <laughs> gardener. And I, when I ever chat to you, Adam, it always reminds me why I why I'm a part of Garden Organic. And thanks for inviting me to do uh, it. Cheers, it's mate. a pleasure, mate. <laughs> Okay, so now it's time to open the Garden Organic post bag. Hannah, I believe you've got some questions for us. 
I do, yes. So the first one has come in from someone who's written to say they have tiny white flies on their brassica plants. They're asking what are they and how do they get rid of them? Luckily, we've got Dr Anton Rosenfeld with us to answer. So Anton, what are your thoughts? Well, these are brassica white flies. They're slightly different to the ones which you find in your glass house. Um, They may look unsightly, but they don't actually do loads of damage to your plants. If they really get out of hand, they can cause a little sort of sooty mould to form on on your plants, but they will eventually go away, especially when the weather gets gets worse. Um, There's quite a bit of different types of advice I could give on these. One of them is your actual choice of plants that you grow. I find things like the really curly kales are... An absolute magnet for the white flies because they sort of reside in all the little crinkles of the leaves. So I tend to go for a variety that's got slightly flatter leaves, something like um, Red Russian or Ragged Jack, which is in our Heritage Seed Library. That seems to attract less white fly in my experience. But I think there are worse pests around. There, there are things which are, can do more damage to your plants, like the cabbage aphid, for example. So you can wash them off, can't you? Because I last year I had kale growing, a wrinkly leaf kale. Yeah. And I remember hitting it, like tapping it, and it just exploded in a cloud of white fly. Well, first of all, I thought, well, why is the glasshouse white fly suddenly outside? But you're actually saying it's a different type of white fly. That's right. The ones in your glasshouse are completely different species. They look they look very similar, but the ones that attack your tomato plants are different to the so, so, ones. So, so, yeah, so it's a curveball, actually. There's a, there's a brassica white fly. Yep. What I found what actually cured it was the first frost. That's what actually solved the problem for me. I didn't really do anything with it because I could pick the leaves and wash them in the sink and it didn't, didn't bother me and, uh, it's because you wash the white fly off. But actually, the first frost... They were gone. So is it worth just waiting till you get that first frost? Or? Well, it's funny you should say... I'm just going to interrupt a minute because it's funny you say about tapping them and they all fly up. I'd read somewhere, and I don't know if this is going to work or not, you can tap and hoover. <laughs> you, can, really, you can get a little tiny hoover because I saw someone on a jewellery store using one yesterday. Well, there you go. They go, and I almost stopped and said, where did you get that hoover? It was ready. <laughs> so it could be a potentially a white fly hoover then. <laughs> but I interrupted. I'm sorry, Anton. Do you, so you think it's worth waiting until the first frost, like Chris? I would say that. Often, also, I find with women to brassicas is is the leaves that have been growing through the summer tend to look quite manky because you probably haven't been picking them you've been sort of focusing on your courgettes and beans once you pick those outer leaves off it sort of tends to rejuvenate the plant and the younger leaves it it likes the cold weather the brassica doesn't it i think it responds i'm looking at my ones now and i've been absolutely battered by a cabbage white they've been really eaten and um, but i'm not panicking because i know that growth will go and then new growth will come on and i'll start to crop that kale later in the year yeah. So the answer, I think, Hannah, is wait until the frosts tolerate them. I think or buy a very small hoover. <laughs> I think that's one of the interesting things you sort of learn when you learn more about organic gardening. You, you assume that something comes in, a bug or a fly or a pest, and it's like, oh, how do I get rid of it? But we've seen so many times, actually. That patience is very important. We've said it over and over. Wait is no, no predator as well on pests. Don't panic if you see green fly or broad black fly and you run of broad beans or ladybirds will come and sort it out that kind of holding back and letting nature deal with it is a fundamental part of organic gardening I, I would say absolutely gives you one less job to do as well which is always yeah. nice um, so the next one is about fruit so someone's written in and said they've noticed lots of pears are going brown and rotting while they're still on the tree how can they stop this that's a good question and I've got it on my own pear trees. Um, I've been picking and taking the pears off as soon as I've seen they've gone brown and rotting. Anton, what are your thoughts? Well, the clue's in the name of the disease. It's called <laughs> brown rot um, and you're doing exactly the right thing. Is is There's not, not much you can do about it once you've got it, but the thing is to try and sort of prevent it, particularly happening next year as well. So if you can take those fruits off, that will prevent it from spreading to any other fruits and it'll also prevent spreading to next year. So you need to be quite vigilant in removing those fruits and also cutting off any sort of spurs which got sort of infected fruits on them as well because the spurs, the, the wood can be infected and that can be carried over to next year. And so I assume it... also that if they're brown and rotten, if I let them fall to the ground, that's how it's going to perpetuate. What is actually causing this rotting? Is it fungus, isn't it? It's a fungus, yeah. 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 I'd also advise not to compost the fruit, which is... So the fruit, the fruit and the spurs are incubating that fungus then. Yeah. So, they, they still, so there's the mycelium of the fungus will stick in there and then that's what's reinfecting. So yeah. this is a hygiene issue then, is it? It, it is exactly that. And, um, 
Yeah, basically, if you can get rid of stuff off the ground, pick the, get rid of the fruits, um, don't compost it. And part of your pruning regime is removing dead, diseased and damaged material. DDD and all those. Yeah. Mm. Mm. So if you're not composting the pears, would you put them in your sort of council green waste collection? And how is that better? You're not spreading it then to the whole neighbourhood? The council waste bin will get up to hot enough temperatures to get rid of the disease, whereas your um, domestic compost waste bin will, won't. There's no guarantee that it will get up to temperatures to kill. So you want to have a natural sterilisation, don't you, with temperatures that will kill off any, any unwanted fungal spores or mycelium. Yeah. And that's done naturally through volume. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I really hope that the person who sent us this question, which is a very valid question close to my heart, I hope you've actually got some pears left on your tree like I have. It may be only about a dozen, but at least they're still there and they seem to be fine. So it's not like the whole tree is well, well, um Will thinning help with this? Well, if, you, if you've got like a big clusters, because I've, I've had this on pl- an old plum tree and it's been pretty devastating. But, um, if I thin those plums out, would that help reduce that? Or That can do as well, yeah, because it increases the airflow around the plums and uh, less likely to get sort of humid conditions which will propagate the disease. So is it um, an issue seen on pear trees, plum trees, any Apples. other, or is it all fruit Apples trees? as well. And the same advice goes for all? All of them, yeah. Okay, great. So the next question um, is about tomatoes. So someone said that the leaves on their tomato plant look very sickly and seem to be rotting. What's the issue? Are they going to have any problems with their fruit? And what can they do about it? Well, this sounds very like um, tomato blight or potato blight. They're the same same disease. The, the way to recognise is, is you see sort of blotches which are about the size of a penny on the margin of the leaf. They look slightly grey and yes there is a danger that they will spread to the fruit the first signs on the fruit is that the fruit starts to look slightly grey and sickly and you will find that it's it won't ripen and the fruit will be inedible my advice is by the time you've got to this stage you can just remove the leaves off the plant and that will also improve the air circulation and prevent the sort of likelihood of the fruit becoming rotten as well so remove those infected leaves as soon as possible this is probably more likely to happen in a greenhouse, tomatoes growing in a greenhouse. No, I had, I had a whole crop of, and it was exactly for the reason I had a block of tomatoes on my allotment a couple of years ago and I planted them thick and they were almost like a f- complete foliage cover and when the blight hit it went boom, straight through mm. and that was outdoors. So I think that the, uh, the movement of air is the, 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 the main ingredient here, isn't it? Making sure there's a, a, that the breezes get through them and they're, not, they're separated out a little bit. There's two issues here. Some people tend to think that um, glasshouse crops are less susceptible to blight. Um, This is partly because the rainfall is less likely to drop onto the leaves in a crop growing in the glasshouse, so the leaves can remain dry. And it's the wet leaves which are needed to spread that blight. And if you water at the base, then it should be less of a problem. And if you're taking off the infected leaves and potentially the fruit, can they be composted? That's, that's an interesting one. Generally, infected leaves are, are fine to put in your compost because they will dry out and it won't get spread around. Fruits I'd be a little bit more wary of. They could grow into infected plants, which could, could then spread the disease for next year. OK, great. That's really useful. Thank you. I hope you too find Anton's advice helpful. I find I'm always learning from him. Don't forget, you can email us if you have ideas of what you'd like us to discuss. Just email podcast at gardenorganic.org.uk and there's plenty of information on the Garden Organic website on all the subjects that we've talked about. Next month is a bumper seed saving edition. We'll be exploring the best way to save seeds and taking you on a tour of our heritage seed library. Here we keep, store and share those rare heirloom varieties which can't be bought commercially. We'd love you to join us. Until then, happy organic growing everyone. Thanks to Kevin McLeod for providing the music.